Okay, so today we're going to do uh, something called stability analysis. And we're going to do it in the context of the um, chemostat model we've been talking about. In fact, today we're going to wrap up our chemostat model analysis. And we're going to be using the tools we learned in, um, or you guys learned in linear algebra. And we're going to linearize the system around the steady states and figure out their dynamics. Okay, so uh, just as a, as a way to, to start, recall, uh, linear systems. So if a, if a system looks like this, y prime equals matrix times y, what was the most important thing you learned last time? How can you figure out the stability of this system, whether the solutions blow up to infinity or whether they converge to the origin? How can you know, how can you know that? Okay, you look at the eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are all in the complex plane, right? So suppose that the eigenvalues are, let's say, here and here. Um, let's say this is a two-dimensional system. So what can you tell about the system? See, the one eigenvalue is minus one, the other one is minus two. Then what? What do you think? The solutions, the typical solution over time, the typical solution over time decays to zero. Okay? What I'm doing here is I'm plotting a typical solution only, only with respect to the variable x1. Sorry, let's, let's do y1. So there's two variables, let's say y1 and y2. And you can plot them separately if you want, actually. You can plot y1 over time. And you can plot y2 over time. Let's say this one is y2. So notice that they are both part of the same solution. The solution is y of t. It has two components, y1 and y2. But they both go to 0 over time. Okay. What happens if the solution has a positive eigenvalue and say, I don't know, let's say an, a negative and a positive eigenvalue. What do you think? What does a typical solution look like? It grows, that's right. Okay, so if the eigenvalues are negative, uh, the system is stable, uh, positive eigenvalues are associated with blowing up. So if you have both, which one wins? On the other hand, it's stable because of this guy. On the other hand, it's unstable because of this guy. And the unstable wins. Right? It's almost like there's two canonical solutions to this system. One stable and the other one unstable. And if you start out in a generic initial condition, it's some kind of blend between the stable and the unstable solution. So on the one hand side, the stable solution becomes smaller and smaller. On the other side, the unstable part of the solution blows up. So the whole thing blows up. Okay? So if there's a positive and a negative eigenvalue, the positive eigenvalue wins. It's more important and the whole thing blows up. Okay. What happens if you have um, imaginary eigenvalues? Then what happens with the solution? Uh, the typical solution. Exactly, it fluctuates. The typical solution starts oscillating, but it becomes smaller and smaller, right? And what happens if the Eigenvalues are over here. Um, what do you think? Uh, it's they oscillate, okay, and they become smaller or bigger every time? Uh, bigger. bigger every time. Are you sure? Or same period. What do you think? Bigger, bigger right? Bigger, yes. Uh, if they if they oscillate by remain the same amplitude, how, how what would you expect in the eigenvalues? How would the eigenvalues look like? So if this if this is if the typical solution does something like this, how would you expect the eigenvalues to look like? 
Um, Sandra. Um, on the y on the y axis itself, yes. Yes. That's right. Okay? So So negative real part is associated with stability. Positive real part is associated with instability. If you have both, then the instability wins. That's why sometimes you call this thing the leading eigenvalue. For example, this guy and this guy are called leading eigenvalue. Because that's really the one that matters the most for the dynamics of the system. If the leading eigenvalue is positive, the whole thing blows up. If the leading eigenvalue is negative, the solution starts stable. And I'm talking about the generic solutions. There's always some, some solution, for example, that could be going to zero even if the system in general blows up. For example, in this case, the fact that there's a negative eigenvalue means that there's a solution associated with this particular eigenvalue that goes to zero. Okay? But the generic solution still blows up because this guy is kind of like more dominant. Okay? <clears throat> okay, and then um, the other thing is that imaginary or complex complex eigenvalues are associated with oscillations. And just like in the first comment, the oscillations are stable or unstable depending on the sign of the real part. There's this, uh, there's this joke. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this. Uh, well, I'm not sure if this joke is going to work. But there's, a, there's, a, there's an Eastern European plane uh, flying and going through some turbulence. And so a guy, a guy comes out of the cockpit and says, all the poles uh, go to the left. That's to stabilize the, the, the plane. That's because sometimes these, these guys are called poles too. So if all the poles are on the left, then <laughs> the, the plane sta becomes stable. Right. All right. So um, I know, bad joke. All right. So uh, anyway, so um, one more thing. I don't know if uh, Knut did this in class. I suspect he didn't have time to do this, but but 2D two D systems have a particularly nice way of, of telling whether the system is stable or not. Uh, if the system is y prime equals a b c d times y, two dimensional case, we talk about the trace of the system. This is the trace. Can anybody tell me what the trace is in this case? Trace of a matrix? A plus Z, that's right. OK. What about the determinant? This is you guys did already. So the determinant of A is AD minus CB. Okay, so again, special 2D case. Turns out you can tell whether or not the real part of the eigenvalues is less than zero <clears throat> Let me write it like this. The statement that the both eigenvalues of negative real part is equivalent to saying that tau is less than zero. Oh, wait a minute. This is uh, I'm using d in two different ways. Sorry. Uh, let's call this guy d. And d is bigger than zero. I don't know if you guys knew this. Did you know this? 
you can, if you want, in, in the two-dimensional case, you don't actually need to figure out the eigenvalues. You just look at the matrix, calculate the, the, the trace and the determinant, and if these conditions are both satisfied, then this is true. I'm pretty sure the opposite is true too, that if these things are negative, then these two conditions are satisfied. Okay? How do you tell, how do you remember these, these signs? For example, think the system y prime equals to minus i times y is equal to minus minus 1, minus 1, 0, and 0. This system is stable, right? Do you agree? This is just a, you know, a, this is just a system y1 is equal to minus y1 prime is equal to minus y1, y2 prime is equal to minus y2. Stable. The, the, the trace of this thing is what? Trace is equal to negative 2 is negative. And the determinant is 1, which is positive. Okay? So if you're ever confused about which, which way these signs go, just think about this system and that'll, that'll guide you. Okay? Um, the proof of this thing, I'm actually leaving for the homework. Uh, it's not hard to see, but we actually want to focus on something else today. So, homework. And as part of that homework, I'm actually going to ask you guys to d develop something more, you know, going beyond this. As a matter of fact, by telling the, the, the by looking at the, these two numbers and how they compare with each other, their signs and which one is bigger than which other one, you can actually tell the dynamics of the system. Is it uh, uh, oscillatory, stable, unstable? Is it a saddle? What is it? You can just you can tell all these things just by looking at these two values. Okay, mind you that that only works in 2D. If you do if you have three-dimensional systems, you know, the the two guys are not going to tell you enough information. But in the 3D case, you can just look at these two guys and that's it. Okay, so that's what we're going to do today with the um, chemostat model. We're going to we're going to linearize around the steady states. We're going to look at the trace and the determinant, and we're going to show that it's uh, that they have the right signs. Therefore, the system is stable. Okay, that's what we're going to do. So let's write down the system. Back to the chemostat model. Once again, you have this uh, tank with bacteria living happily in here. Um, there's a, a flux of food coming in and out comes food and bacteria. Um, of course, N is bacteria. C is food. And the system has a complicated form, but we, what we did is we non-dimensionalized non the system. So it has much simpler form. And uh, the, the form of the system is d n dt equals, well, let me write it down from here, it's alpha 1 c over 1 plus c <coughs> times n minus n and uh, the c dt is equal to minus c over 1 plus c n minus c plus alpha 2. So only two parameters. Okay. Um, <coughs> This, has, this, the, uh, this term has to do with the uh, bacteria flushing out. This term has to do with the food flushing out of the tank. And this term has to do with the food coming back into the tank on the other side. And these terms have to do with the bacteria actually growing and consuming food as they grow. OK? All right. <clears throat> um, mind you, in principle, and I'm going to remind you of this later more, but in principle, after we did this non-dimensionalization, we had a bunch of asterisks. These, these variables are actually are officially called n asterisk, c asterisk, and so forth. Those were the new variables after non-dimensionalization. 
but we decided to ignore them because they look ugly. Okay? We said, we don't want to deal with asterisks all over the place, so just ignore them. Okay? And that's going to come back to bite us in the end of the lecture. Because we're going to have two C's, the, the new C and the old C. We're going to call them both C's, so it's a mess, right? So if we are talking about the old variables and the new variables, then we're going to write those asterisks back. Okay? Uh, but we're only going to do it in the end, when, when we're going to talk about old variable and new variable at the same time. Okay, so we did this analysis, and we found two steady states. Okay, um, uh, one steady state I'm going to call, okay, that's, you know, let's use a notation from the book. It's, it's N1 bar, C1 bar, and um, let's just write it down here just for the sake of, uh, for the sake of the, uh, of com completeness. It's a, it's a bit of a mess, and it's in terms of alpha 1 and alpha 2. Uh, so it's alpha 1 times alpha 2 minus 1 over alpha 1 minus 1. And C2 bar, I'm sorry, C1 bar is um, 1 over alpha 1 minus 1. OK, both of these guys must be bigger than 0, OK, for the, th for the system to be biologically reasonable. Okay. Uh, notice that this condition is only true if some conditions on alpha 1 and alpha 2 are satisfied. For example, this guy cannot possibly be bigger than 1 unless alpha 1 is uh, bigger than 1. If alpha 1 is not bigger than 1, there's no way this thing's going to be bigger than, than, than 0. So one condition is that alpha 1 is bigger than uh, 1. And the other condition is that alpha 2 is bigger than 1 over alpha 1 minus 1. Okay. So if these two conditions are satisfied, then we have this steady state, and that steady state is positive. Okay, why do we care about having a positive steady state? What happens if we have a steady state, but I don't know, n is equal to zero at that steady state? Then what does that mean? There's no bacteria, There's no bacteria right? If we want to have a tank that's at steady state. We, you know, we we want to call it an actual chemostat. We we better have some bacteria growing in there, right? Otherwise, what's the point, right? So so we want there to be a steady state that has positive uh, values. And this thing is always a steady state. You can always plug, uh, plug in those values, and they'll give you 0. But they're only positive if these things are satisfied. Otherwise, they're not, you know, the steady state is not biologically reasonable. OK. There is another steady state. There's another steady state that's easier to write. It's n2 bar, c2 bar is equal to 0, comma, um, alpha 2. That steady state is always there, no matter what. But notice that there is no bacteria. And that's steady state. So that's kind of like the boring one, OK? So we are going to assume that these conditions are satisfied, so that we have two steady states, one here, one there. OK. Now what we want to do is question what is the stability stability of the system around the positive steady state? And I ask about the positive steady state because I care more about the positive state state than about this one. Uh, you can also do the analysis around this one, but we're going to focus on that one. I think this one will be actually a little bit easier. Um, <clears throat> so 
Okay. So I'm going to write this as c over 1 plus c times n minus n. I'm going to write this guy as f of ng, actually big N, big F. And I'm going to write this guy minus alpha 1, 1, sorry, c over 1 plus c, n minus c plus alpha 2. I'm going to call this thing G of N, sorry, G of NC. Okay? And now I'm going to calculate the Jacobian <coughs> of the system. Do you guys remember what the Jacobian of the system is around the point? What is it? It's the partial derivatives, right? But in what order? Uh, do you wanna do you wanna try? What are, in what order do the, the partial derivatives come for the Jacobian? Partial f, partial n. Okay, and over here. Okay, that's right. So, what is the Jacobian again? If we have a steady state, for example, the point uh, n, n1 hat, c1 hat, okay? And you wanna look at the system around that, that point, that steady state. Then it behaves a lot like the linear system given by this expression. Okay, let me write this down again, just as a reminder of why we care about the Jacobian. Recall, if n hat c hat is a steady state, of the system, then locally, around n hat c hat, the dynamics of the system is very similar to that of um, y prime equals j uh, times y where j is evaluated at the point n hat c hat. Okay? So this system, this linear system, and the original system look very, very similar around the point nc. That's why we care about the Jacobian. Okay, so now let's look at the Jacobian. What is the Jacobian of this system? Does anybody want to try? Uh, do you want to try? Alpha 1 C over 1 plus C minus 1. Okay, minus 1. And the next one is the partial derivative with respect to C, right? Yeah. So you have to use the All right. Use the quotient rule. Let's, let's go back here and let's write f of x equals x divided by 1 plus x. What's the derivative of this thing? 1 plus x times 1 minus. Yeah. I usually don't like using the quotient rule, but let's do it. So quotient rule, derivative of this times 1 plus x minus derivative of this times this. And this is 1 plus x minus x. It's 1 divided by 1 plus x squared. Okay? So 
over here, when I derivate with respect to c, I get alpha 1 1 divided by 1 plus c squared uh, multiplied by n. Okay, what about this one here? Who wants to try? Good you want to try? Yes? Um, is dc dt supposed to have alpha 1 in front of that first term or no? Oh, good point. Uh, no, it doesn't. Thanks for pointing that out. Thanks. Do you want to try? <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. And then partial with respect to C would be negative 1 over 1 plus C squared. Mm-hmm. Minus 1. What about the N? Oh, yeah, N times N. Okay. That's it? Awesome. OK, so good. So now let's evaluate this at the point. Yeah, I really should have written that over somewhere else, because now I'm going to um, cover that. Well, it's OK. Let's just try and do it. So OK, so now let's evaluate the Jacobian. at the point in 1, C1. OK, and I don't want to write the whole thing there. It's going to be a little bit messy. So let's just write, let's write component by component. Let, 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 me, let, let me write this down first. So DFDN is um, alpha 1 times C1 hat 1 plus C1 hat minus 1. And do you remember what the expression is for C1 hat? That's somewhere, where did we write it? Over there, right? 1 over alpha 1 minus 1. So this is alpha 1 divided by this minus 1. OK? Now I'm going to multiply up and down by alpha 1 minus 1. And I get alpha 1 times 1 over alpha 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1. You see something funny happening here? Are you surprised? Alpha 1 minus 1 plus 1 is alpha 1, right? Can I just start with alpha 1? So this thing is 1, and this thing minus 1 is 0. Great. OK. Nice. Um, Yes. There's another term. Well, actually, no. Let's let's just let's just uh, let's just finish this. Therefore, the the trace the trace of the of a is equal to what? It's equal to this plus this, right? But the first one is 0, OK, uh, minus n over the squared minus 1, OK? And what's the sign of that thing? Well, remember we said that n1 hat and c1 hat are positive, right? So this whole thing is positive. Okay? 
you take something that is negative and you subtract one, it becomes even more negative. So this whole thing is negative. Okay, that points towards stability, right? Because we said if the trace is negative and the determinant is positive, the system is stable. But we're not done. We still need to show that the determinant is positive. Okay. Now, um, before before I calculate the determinant. Let me let me show let me let me let me point out what we showed here. We showed that we showed that alpha one times this thing minus one is equal to zero. So we showed that alpha one times c one bar divided by one plus c one bar is equal to one. Do you see that? Because we show that this whole thing is equal to zero, so that means that this guy is equal to one. Okay? Now, let's calculate the determinant. Determinant is equal to this times this minus this times this. Right? Now this guy is zero, so this times this is zero. So it's 0 minus this times this. Um, like this. 0 minus minus C1 this times alpha 1 times 1 plus c bar squared minus 1. Sorry, no minus 1, sorry. Times n. OK. All right. So now, do you see anything that we can simplify here? OK, the two negatives go disappear and become one positive. OK, good. What else? Exactly. We just said this, right? This thing is 1. Then the whole thing is equal to n 1 bar divided by 1 plus c 2 sorry, c1 bar squared. And what sign does that have? It's actually positive. Because each of these things is positive. n1 and uh, c1, c1 are both positive. OK, so, so we can conclude that that steady state is what? Stable, right? Great. So since since the trace is negative and the determinant is positive for the steady state n1 hat c1 hat, we conclude that this steady state is <coughs> stable. Awesome. Okay, so we can do a similar analysis, but we're not going to do it because I think we're going to run out of time. But we can show Um, maybe I'm going to leave it as a homework. Maybe the system in two 
C2 is unstable. But if the conditions Um, let me call these conditions 1. So the conditions are the conditions alpha 1 bigger than 1, alpha 2 bigger than this thing. These are the conditions that ensure that this steady state is positive. If these conditions are not satisfied, then what do you think happens? Then there's only one steady state, right? One real, one, one, one actual biologically reasonable steady state. Because if these conditions fail, then there's only one positive steady state. Or you know, not, or one non-negative steady state. Okay? So what do you think should happen with, the, with this steady state? Is it still unstable? It becomes, it becomes stable. Because you see the solutions have to go somewhere. Okay? If these conditions are, 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 are not satisfied, then uh, the, there's only one st um, non-negative steady state in the system. If these conditions are not satisfied, then N2, C2 becomes stable. All right, sorry, this was a beautiful mouthful, but you see what we were doing, right? I mean, in, in the end, it's really not that hard. We are calculating the steady states. We are linearizing around the steady states, and we're figuring out whether each of these linearizations is stable or not. OK, awesome. So I want, to, I want to finish by talking a little bit about those two conditions. So. If we are doing a mathematical analysis of this biological system, it would be great if we can find some way to express these conditions in biological terms. What is it that what does it mean for these conditions to be to, to hold? Okay. And we talked a little bit about this the last time. It sounds like it would be very messy, you know, like what do you mean this? Ugly conditions being satisfied. Can you can you possibly find a biological interpretation of that? Um, well, what were the values of alpha one and alpha two again? Okay, this is the volume of the system of the tank. This is the flow in and out. And k max is the fastest speed of, uh, of growth, the, fastest val the largest value for the, for the variable k, k of c. And what was alpha 2 again? OK. So alpha 1 bigger than zero is equivalent to saying that this guy is bigger than zero, which is the same thing as saying that k max, sorry, one over k max is uh, bigger than v over f. OK. Now, what was 1 over k max again? Remember, if, if, if the bacteria are growing at a rate of k, so for example, if you have this system n prime equals k times n, what does, what does 1 over k mean again? Are you sure it's the rate of change? It should be less than 1 over k max is less than 0. Oh, did I get the wrong sign? Let me see. Uh, yeah, you're right. Less. Thanks. 
Okay, so what was uh, 1 over k max again? Remember that we calculated the, the, the doubling time of the, of the bacteria? What was it again? Well, you remember the units for k max? 1 over time, right? So 1 over k max is what units? Time. Time for what? So it's actually the doubling time. You know, if you have a system that grows like this, the doubling time is, I think, is logarithm of 2 divided by k. Okay? So give or take logarithm of 2, this is basically the doubling time. And except for that factor of, of uh, logarithm of 2, this is very much the doubling time. And it's actually not any doubling time because we're talking about the k max. This is the maximal, the fastest doubling time, right? Let's call this the max or, or fastest doubling time. OK, what about v over f? What do you think, how, do, how, do, how can we interpret v over f? It's the time for what? Suppose the, suppose the volume has, I don't know, 100 uh, cubic feet, right? And this flow is something like 10 feet per minute, or 5 feet per minute, 5 cubic feet per minute. Then what does V over F stand for? It's a units of time. Exactly. It's a time for flushing the whole tank, right? This is the time for flushing all the tank. Right? Awesome. So now we have a biological condition for this, uh, a biological interpretation for this. The maximum, the, the fastest doubling time needs to be faster than the time for flashing a tank. Okay, does that make sense? I mean, is that biologically reasonable? You know, if if the bacteria don't divide fast enough, then they could all get flushed out. You know, before they have time to divide. Right. So this this kind of biological interpretation of it is 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 is, is, is more meaningful than just writing a, an inequality. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, what about the other one? Yes, sir. If we need all of our old variables just to make sense of the system, why yes. don't we redefine them in constants that we, I mean, eventually don't recognize anymore? Uh, and I forgot what alpha 1 was and alpha 2 was. So when we're looking at equations in terms of alpha 1 and alpha 2, it's kind of hard to make sense of everything. Why do we even do that if, if we need the whole variables just to understand the system? Well, you know, the analysis of the system was messy enough as it was. Even we only had two parameters, alpha 1 and alpha 2. So if we did everything in terms of these six parameters, the analysis would be more complicated. So my, my, my take would be, you're asking a very good question, but I think the answer is, is also a valid one, which is that you first do the analysis in the simplified framework, in the non-dimensionalized simplified system, and then you go back to the original system. And going back in this case means talking about the original parameters. Okay? Now, the second condition makes us go back even more because it makes us talk about the original variables, C and N, not the asterisk ones. Uh, the second condition is the second condition is this guy. Alpha 2 is bigger than 1 over alpha 1 minus 1. It's equivalent to, and do you remember 1 over alpha 1 minus 1? We've seen this guy before. What is that?
Got it written somewhere in here. C1 bar. C1 bar, that's right. Thank you, sir. Uh, and alpha 2 is C0 divided by Kn. Bigger than C1 bar. OK. But now I want to be a little bit more specific. This, this uh, C1 bar is in terms of the new variables after non-dimensionalization. The new variables after non-dimensionalization in principle must have an asterisk. It's just we didn't write it because we were too lazy. But really, they should have an asterisk. OK? So new, new variable. I'm just writing it again because we should have written it all along, except we didn't. So I'm going to write this down as equivalently as C0 bigger than C1 hat asterisk times Kn. But if you remember, and I don't expect you to remember necessarily because we did a lot of stuff in the meantime, but when we set up the um, the conversion from all variables to new variables, we said c is equal to c star times c hat. Right? This was this conversion uh, 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 parameter. And remember what we said c hat to be equal to? It was kn. When we did the, the non dimensionalization, we said c hat to be kn. So that means that. This is C1 star times C hat, which is equal to the original steady state before non-dimensionalization. OK? Mike, like you were saying before, like we were saying before, we first non-dimensionalize, do the whole analysis, and then if we want to, we can go back to the original variables by writing the same equation. You know, just like you define these new variables, you can come back to the old variables. OK? All right, so there we have it. So this whole thing says that this condition is equivalent to C0 bigger than C1 hat, where C1 hat is the food concentration at steady state, right? OK, so what does this say? This, not the amount of the, the concentration, right? OK, so the, the food influx concentration must be bigger than the steady state food concentration. Is that reasonable biologically to assume? It makes sense, right? If, if, you, if, if you hope the steady state to be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you hope to have a steady state of food in a tank by throwing food into the tank and having bacteria living there, biologically, it's just only natural to expect the steady state food concentration to be less than the, the influx, OK? The, the food concentration is not going to get any bigger because the bacteria are eating it. They're not like producing food. Okay, so there you go. These two these two uh, hypotheses are now uh, written in terms in biological terms. And if these two are satisfied, then the positive steady state exists, and you have a working uh, thermostat with bacteria happily growing. Okay. Do you guys have any questions? OK, then we're going to stop. Um, and uh, we're going to start next week, uh, sorry, on Friday, we're to talk about uh, a new subject, chapter 5.